The Bridge by Jared Morris and Brian Clymer, read by the authors, published by 10X Records, prologue. It started with shadows in the night, followed by an impossibly bright light. Under big sky country, sound travels far and wide, and there's always any number of hoots and bangs cast on the wind. But this sound was too close. It was too near his home. It was too near the bone. Its origin, unknown. But its source, unmistakable. Suddenly, Gus Tomlin's property was illuminated. Tomlin shook the sleep from his eyes and squinted at the blindingly bright light. You never get used to how bright that light is. Tomlin had rigged up an old locomotive headlamp that he converted into a motion-activated security spotlight for his property. It was one of his projects. Best he could tell, it had a luminosity of 3,800 to 5,000 lumens. It was bright. He set it up after the coyote dump two years back. Though to Tomlin, the idea was morally gray, hunting coyotes is legal and even encouraged in his native Montana. Although, if there were an injured coyote, or worse, rabid, he'd do what he had to do. Tomlin even kept an old Ruger American around for such an unfortunate occasion. He was never quick to rely on it, however. He still lived by the Old West credo. A gun can't solve a problem. It can only delay it. He disliked people that showed off their guns or expressed excitement over the prospect of shooting a living thing. A gun was a serious tool and should be respected. Owning one, he thought, did not a personality make. Property owners in Montana had no real restrictions on the discharging of firearms on their own private property. In fact, the law clearly states a property owner in Montana has the right to shoot on his own property without any interference from a government entity. As long as he's not being careless or disregarding the safety of others, no one was going to bother him. Tomlin was well-known around town as a slightly eccentric rail fan. He was perhaps best known for pasties. About three times a year, he'd take a trip to Missoula for a train hobbyist event. He'd always stopped at Lefty's for some of Linda's flaky pasties. It was a delicacy that his mother brought over from Britain and served for the family on special occasions, like scraped knees or lost pets. It brought back good memories for him, and he liked to share them with his neighbors. The coyote dump last summer was a case of baffled police and wildlife experts, and Tomlin most of all. He kept losing hens to the sly foxes, but it, that was the nature of things. Rick got in more than a few scraps with the local fox population. Old Rick wasn't as tough as he thought he was. But it was a fetid smell that he noticed first. They say that if you've ever smelled death, you'll never forget the smell. Amplify that by a factor of 10. Back by the tree line, somebody dumped the carcasses of a whole lot of dead coyotes. There were so many, and the scene was so nauseating that it took the wildlife enforcement and emergency management nearly a week to properly dispose of them. In the summer heat, it was like working through a rotten Everest of fur and bone. Chief Archer of the Crow Agency Police Department told Gus it was probably somebody who didn't want to spring for the landfill. The landfill is the proper place to dispose of a kill, but he still couldn't explain the sheer number. There were 74 dead and tagged coyotes at the western edge of Tomlin's property. Somebody had a busy night. Wildlife Enforcement Agent Josh Steiner told KCAG, quote, So we were walking back there. First, it looked like a whole bunch of deer or coons or something. We got closer and closer, and it was just literally a pile of dead coyotes, all piled up. They never released a manner of death. Tomlin thought it strange. There was no western access to the ranch, and he hadn't seen anyone sneaking around with 70 dead dogs. So, security lights went up. He called the main floodlight Casey Jones. Tomlin kept one window in his bedroom perpetually propped open with an old cookbook year-round. He liked to feel the fresh mountain air across his face. The broken window was one of the many repairs that needed to be done that he only thought about at night, quickly forgetting at first light. 
About once a week, a large animal, a bear or elk, would wander too close to the security perimeter and set off old Casey. Tom was used to it by now, the blinding bright floodlight illuminating the ranch like it was noontime. He wasn't used to what came next that night. Gus wasn't a man that startled easily. Tomlin was a retired railroad dick. He thought he had fairly solid nerves, and his train hobby left him more than a little deaf in his left ear. He'd used a gun on the job, of course, but the sound of a gun firing so close to his open window, he had to admit, made his cheeks clench. He didn't know who the first bullet was intended for, but there was no mistake about number two. As Gus pushed aside the large cookbook and his eyes adjusted to the bright light, he saw young Steve Saunders place a handgun under his chin and blow his own brains all over the evergreen. Gus would never forget the look on Steve's face before he pulled the trigger. He later described it as blank. Afterwards, he didn't have a face at all. Shit on a shingle, Gus murmured. The future. Somewhere in the bridge. Initiate tachyonic and I signal. Result equals QBM dot run. Initiate qubits conversion to electrons. Electrons conversion to photon light. Photon light reformed to date. Send, send, sending. Introduction. The question that has plagued and fascinated mankind since, undoubtedly, its early days is what is the nature of consciousness? Is it something that can be quantified or even detected? Can you even be sure consciousness is real or is it being acted out, aped and approximated? Philosophies like solipsism ask if you can be sure of any other living thing is actually self-aware. Since the 1970s, Behavioralists and scientists have used the mirror self-recognition test to determine if animals are self-aware. If so, can they recognize themselves in a mirror? The mirror self-test was developed by Gordon Gallup Jr., Tulane University biopsychologist. An oversimplification of the test is that the researcher marks an animal on an area that the animal can't normally see. He places the animal in front of the mirror, and if the animal can identify the mark on itself based on its reflection, it's said to be able to recognize that the reflection in the mirror is a reflection of itself. It's quite a limited test, as many animals may have different ways of understanding self. They may be able to identify themselves through scent, pheromones, brain waves, or any number of things we don't yet understand. Only a few creatures have passed this test, the usual suspects, great apes, elephants, and dolphins. The most famous diagnostic tool to test whether machines have become self-aware or possess artificial intelligence is the Turing test. In this test, the researcher tries to gauge the humanness of a computer by comparing its answers to questions the humans have answered on other machines. The reverse of this is when man has to prove its humanness to machines, of which the CAPTCHA test would qualify by identifying non-alike pictures, sounds, or letters, The user has to identify the correct items. Another limited test is the philosophical statement made by Descartes. I think, therefore I am. Which is fine to determine your own self-awareness, but it's not a test you can apply to others. You can never know if somebody is thinking or if it's rote behavior or even predetermined reaction to stimuli. As of 2018, computers were being trained to recognize patterns in the brain by using functional magnetic resonance imaging machines, fMRI. These machines were able to output the approximation of an image detected from the patient's thoughts. The patient looks at an image, and the machine is able to output a representation of the image using algorithms and deep neural networks. Later that year, researchers at Kyoto University and Japan's ATR Computational Neuroscience Laboratory said, 
Our method successfully generated the reconstruction to artificial shapes, indicating that our model indeed reconstructs or generates images from brain activity, not simply to exemplars. They're paving the way for devices that can identify thought patterns, or truly, if you like, to read the patient's mind. None of these early efforts or philosophies answer the question, however, what's the nature of consciousness? How do I know if you are self-aware? These early tests, like the Kyoto Method, have become interesting scientific tools. When fine-tuned and with the full power of the Internet behind it, they can now be used to finally solve the mystery around what we used to call brain death. It was shown that some, if not most, individuals that were once considered to be brain dead, such an archaic term, were able to think. Interestingly, the machines were able to show that the recently deceased also formed pictures in their dying minds. This led to violent protests by extremists who said scientists were trying to prove away an afterlife. As it turns out, it had the opposite repercussions. Another suggested use for this Kyoto method was when interacting with uncontacted peoples, animals, or any extraterrestrial life that we may come across. Without language being a barrier, mankind would learn to communicate through images with other cultures. Yet, even with this Kyoto method, it's not a flawless test for consciousness. Just as a machine can be trained by algorithms to appear to be acting independently, a man can be programmed to do the same. It takes you back to the age-old philosophy I only know that I alone exist. If I no longer existed, I would no longer know. My mind, consciousness, or body may appear to be me, but my internal consciousness is gone. What about the soul? Hindus once believed, as spelled out in the Bhagavad Gita, that everything that has life has a soul. In the Bhagavad in the Bhagavatam, it's written, quote, when the upper point of hair is divided into 100 parts and again, each of such parts is further divided into 100 parts. Each such part is the measurement and dimension of the spirit soul. The Hindu Atman is also indestructible. A body can die, but the Atman is forever. Ancient Jews believed that the blood carries the soul of a living thing. Therefore, atonement was made with a blood sacrifice. A soul, that something else, consciousness, they all exist in this mysterious murky realm of the unknown or beyond human understanding. It is surprising then that as mankind moves toward a more binary worldview that these bigger questions are being considered too fanciful by much of the population. In a binary society, there's no room for shades of gray. Everyone's life must fall into two options, good, bad, real, fake, important, or not important. This dichotomous thinking was explored by Bob Johansson from the not-for-profit Palo Alto Think Tank Institute of the Future in his seminal work, Full Spectrum Thinking, How to Escape Boxes in a Post-Categorical Future. Quote, being stuck in categorical thought doesn't actually involve much thinking at all. You just assume, without thinking that new experiences will fit into your old boxes, buckets, labels, generalizations, and stereotypes. With the centralization of ideas because of the internet, it's become much easier to fall into tribalism. Then there's the Dunning-Kruger effect, described by social psychologist David Dunning and Justin Kruger. It finds that when one knows a little bit about a topic, they often mistake themselves as experts on the matter. They think in binary because they don't have enough information to argue a counterpoint. In the 2003 research paper, Why People Fail to Recognize Their Own Incompetence, researchers Dale Dunning, Carrie Johnson, Joyce Erlinger, and Justin Kruger wrote, Quote, people tend to be blissfully unaware of their incompetence. Perhaps fittingly, armed with the passing knowledge of the Dunning-Kruger effect, many people consider themselves to be able to properly identify when it is being exhibited. That's a double Dunning-Kruger. Does this burgeoning lack of self-awareness lead to an actual lack of consciousness? We can't tell. But we can study the world around us and see the repercussions of it. John Hu, Ph.D., Hardin, Montana, June 2021. 
Saturday, en route to Crow Reservation. The moon was high in the sky over Route 90 as Sarah Adams drove through the early morning hours. It's always been a widely reported fact amongst game hunters that deer and other large mammals are more active after dark during the full moon, even more so during the rut. Whether this is true or not is immaterial, as people believed it was true. In her 2017 Deer Forest survey, Jessica Hepner, an undergraduate in wildlife and fishery science from Penn State University's College of Agricultural Science and Management, found that 66% of respondents said the phase of the moon had, quote, some effect on deer movement. 22% claimed the moon had, quote, significant effects on deer. Hepner wrote, quote, My grandfather has always been an avid hunter and strongly believes that deer are much more active during the full moon. Hepner, Wandering in the Moonlight, Penn State Deer Forest Survey, 2017. When studying the behavior of cervids, Hepner found that none of the phases of the moon had a significant effect on deer movement. However, deer and other mammals were found to be more active at night than during the day during all three moon phases. Sarah Adams only had to make this particular sojourn once every few months, unless there was an emergency. It took her west of the barren city of Gillette, Wyoming, before jerking sharply to the northwest. It was the easiest way to gain access to the remote areas of the Crow and Northern Cheyenne Reservations. On particularly busy days, she'd stay with a friend in Billings. Tonight, she thought she wouldn't have such luxury. There was a technically faster way to get there. If she took the 212 and could avoid most of all but the tip of the northeastern side of Wyoming. This route was usually advantageous because it would take her straight through the crow, but not this early in the morning. Sarah liked finding patterns and things. She always had. She enjoyed mazes as a kid. She liked watching her dad fiddle with electronics. He explained to her the difference between an open circuit and a closed circuit. He would always give her the schematics he drew up and ask her to, quote, check them for me. She pictured the highways and roads as a huge circuit board connecting towns to towns, cities to cities, and coast to coast. She rarely depended solely on GPS. The hippocampal region of the brain is considered the map maker of the brain. The brain has a way of forming inside itself alternate routes to avoid hazards or traffic slowdowns. As far back as 1948, Edward Tolman of the University of California, Berkeley, was able to show that even rats were able to create new neural paths. Tolman created a maze that he painted black as pitch. He placed a cup of food at the end, and the rat spent the next few hours finding his way to its meal. Tolman continued this for days until finally closing off the route on the fifth day. The rat was then given a new maze with 18 routes. The subject was quickly able to find the correct path. Scientists call this latent learning. As described by Carol Tarvis and Carol Wade in Psychology and Perspective, second edition, latent learning is when one changes behavior only when needed, based on changing situations. The rat's brain stored the data internally and was able to access it even when his external world changed. In humans, we use cognitive schemas to map out areas. The brain creates a mental framework representing something in the physical world. That's why you may need a map the first time you make a trip, but your brain maps landmarks and markers for your subsequent journeys. This makes it more difficult to adapt to change in routine. The brain has a different way of dealing with roadblocks. For example, if someone has a stroke and cells in the brain are damaged or die, the brain doesn't regrow or repair the cells. Instead, the damaged tissue will undergo a process called liquefactive necrosis. A glial membrane forms around the damaged area of the brain, effectively sectioning it off. The damaged area then will fill with Cerebrospinal fluid. For Sarah, growing up in Erie, Pennsylvania, the worst road hazards were sheets of ice in the winter and amorous deer in the spring. The deer became quite lawless, twitterpated, as they say. 
But deer weren't just a problem in Montana. They were the most dangerous animal in the state. More than 100 people a year die in accidents with deer, and one in 47 Montana drivers have a chance of colliding with an animal while driving. In 2020, State Farm of Montana reported more than 17,000 animal collision cases. The deer are a problem because they are so plentiful. Unlike metropolitan areas, Montana has large swaths that have no human settlements for hundreds of miles. According to the insurance provider, Montana ranks number two in the country for automobile animal collisions, second only to wild and wonderful West Virginia. And it wasn't just the deer that posed a threat. In all three states on her commute, South Dakota, Wyoming, and Montana, there were also much larger animals that could wander in the road. Montana alone has elk, bear, and moose. So Sarah had to keep her mind from wandering. A shadow can easily be mistaken for an animal. Unlike a collision with a deer, you're not walking away from hitting a moose. Yet her mind began to wander again. How did I end up here, she thought. Sarah had aspirations of living in a city, maybe Philadelphia. Hell, there are people to help there too, but she found her current calling amidst the underserved populations of the Dakotas, Montana, and Wyoming. She just didn't expect there to be so much wildlife. David Murray of the Great Falls Tribune wrote that hitting a deer in Montana is, quote, almost a rite of passage. During this time of the year, the Montana Highway Safety Agency's official reports aimed to educate drivers. Deer's migration and mating season generally runs from October through December and causes a dramatic increase in the movements of the deer population. As a result, more deer vehicle collisions occur in this period than any other time of year, so drivers need to be especially vigilant. Vigilant. That's it, Sarah. Stay vigilant. Animals on the area's roads are a threat because they haven't adapted their behavior to the behavior of man. Now, some animals run when they hear an automobile. For others, man is a curiosity, more often ignored than feared. Some animals, like moose or deer, enjoy licking the salt off of newly salted roads. It's one of the reasons why you may see more animals in the middle of roadways on icy nights. Moose are more likely to stand their ground, and that's around a bumper cars that your Honda Accord isn't going to win. Some states have gone to what some call extreme measures to deal with the excessive deer on the roadway. Sarah remembered the controversial 2015 Mount Lebanon deer culling in her native Pennsylvania. Seemed like everyone on her Facebook from home had become an expert on deer. The state hired independent sharpshooters to corral and shoot deer in a penned area. During the first year, the program had to be shut down partially due to vandalism and community outrage. WTAE-TV4 Pittsburgh reported that a contractor hired to execute the call was followed while driving near Bird Park. Quote, at one point, a woman exited the vehicle and yelled at the contractor. So under the auspices of reducing deer vehicle collisions, Mount Lebanon spent $220,000 on their controversial sharpshooter program between 2014 and 2018, spending almost $100,000 in the first year alone. Just under 500 deer were harvested. Driving the early morning hours on desolate roads, the primal brain can begin to conjure all sorts of hazards. Researchers in 2012 at the University of Toronto defined this reaction as, quote, lingering, foreboding fear that keeps us on edge. They wrote, this type of anxiety is your body's way of keeping you on your toes in case you need to fight or flight yourself away from danger. It's one of the leftover evolutionary traits that may or may not benefit man. For ancient humans, they had real-life predators to fear, such as lions, bears, other large beasts. In the absence of actual predators, modern man creates their own, uh, or they simply fear things that go parump in the night. Real modern threats were the now many animals displaying the effects of chronic wasting disease. Animals infected with CWD often display a complete lack of fear of people. They're more likely to be found in the open road in between your car and your destination. You can identify them by their dramatic weight loss, impaired coordination. Some have been witnessed stumbling around, drooling, excessive urination, and having 
severe disfigurements and horrific open wounds. Increasing instances of CWD in deer and elk have increased the danger of the roads. The so-called zombie deer disease is a transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. According to individual state data and statistics, it's closely uh, related to the infamous crutchfield Hyakup disease in humans and cows. It's bovine spongiform encephalopathy, more commonly known as mad cow disease. Chronic wasting disease has been found in deer, elk, caribou, and moose. It was first identified in the American Southwest in 1967 in captive deer. On February 4, 1985, CWD was first found in an animal outside of captivity. It was found in a wild mule deer. The Colorado Division of Wildlife attempted to eliminate CWD by treating the soil with chlorine and left the facility at Fort Collins Foothills Wildlife Research Facility vacant for more than a year. The effort was unsuccessful. As more CWD cases were identified, an endemic zone was established in Colorado and Wyoming. It still spread, first amongst the captive populations in places like Saskatchewan and Nebraska, then to wild cervids at the end of the 1990s. On December 28, 2000, CWD was identified in deer in South Korea. In the early 2000s, it quickly spread to Wisconsin, New Mexico, Minnesota, Illinois, Alberta, and Utah. On November 19, 2002, park staff at Cave National Park witnessed a five-year-old elk exhibiting symptoms of CWD. The elk was euthanized and brain tissue was sent to the Colorado State University Diagnostics Lab in Fort Collins. It was as they feared the elk had CWD. It was the first case in Sarah's South Dakota. Though Congress pushed through $4.2 million for funding research in 2003, still was little understood about the affliction. The following year, CWD was set as a national priority by the Canadian Councils of Resource Ministers. Through all the researchers and grants, scientists still didn't know the cause and believed it was linked to a mutated protein uh, so-called prion. Strange, but even stranger, scientists weren't able to identify how the disease was being transmitted. It was first thought that direct animal-to-animal -animal contact was needed, yet more cases brought more questions. In the intervening years, scientists found prions in the leg muscles of infected deer. They found it adheres to soil samples. It's active in blood and saliva and feces. By 2018, CWD it's been identified in nearly 30 U.S. states and Canadian provinces, in addition to Norway and Finland. According to the National Center for Biotechnology Information, researchers found that CWD can be transmitted to other animals, including non-human primates, in a laboratory setting. In a 2014 paper, Brent Ray's Laboratory of Persistent Viral Diseases, Rocky Mountain Laboratories National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, wrote that when Intracerebrally injected CWD can infect agricultural animals and scavengers, yet they found that transgenic mice that have had their cells altered with human prion protein were not susceptible to intracerebral injection, although they identified a high attack rate in squirrel monkeys. As Sarah drove, she tried to remain alert to the threats on the road, but it was difficult for her to quiet her busy mind. She often drifted into her thoughts, not realizing that she missed an exit or a coffee stop. It was only a nearly six-hour drive, but the lack of landmarks not in the landscape made for a monotonous experience. She'd been listening to BBC News on her My Radio app, but driving out in the wild, wild west, it was normal for there to be large gaps in her wireless coverage. She usually settled for listening to whatever public radio station she could get on her Chevy Spark radio. She could usually bounce around the South Dakota Public Broadcasting Network between 88.5 and 102.5 FM. Her home station, KBHE FM, it's 89.3 FM. Now, most of the stations were airing BBC World Service at this time in the morning. As she heard the rumble strip shake her car, her first thought was flat tire. She realized, though, that the dulcet tones and soothing accents 
caused her to nod off. She flipped to the AM band and was able to pick up K-Don 1270 out of Gillette. They had a morning jock giving ag reports, weather, and talk, but the rest of the day and night, they aired syndicated programming. It's the kind you find on every AM station. She thought she could listen to her voice memos and voicemails from the day, but her phone was at 16%. She had to remember to get a new charge cable. Frustrated and eating coffee, she switched back to the FM and hit Seek. In this area of the U.S., it wasn't unusual for the Seek function to lap the band several times before it finds a station with a strong enough signal to register as a station. Yet this time, there was a very strong signal on the higher end of the band at 107.5 FM. She didn't remember hearing the station before, and her memory was usually good for that type of thing. They're playing very bass-heavy hip-hop. In this part of the country, one was more likely to find talk, country, or religious programming. The religious and talk programs ran the gamut from Love FM, all good news, to a guy sounds like he's broadcasting from his bathtub, screaming about low-flow toilets and that everything's a hoax. Sarah thought it was a nice change of pace to hear hip-hop out here in the middle of nowhere. She was half listening, half enjoying the wind on her face from her open driver's side window when she noticed something else about the song. The language being used in the song wasn't what you typically hear on the radio. Perhaps they've changed the seven words you can't say on the radio, she thought, referencing the famous George Carlin bit from the 70s. The regulations have always been more convoluted uh, than which words you can say. It's always been more about preserving decency. It's often difficult to identify. The off-sighted Stewart test for obscenity, named for a 1964 decision by United States Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart, I know it when I see it, is extremely difficult to quantify among changing and evolving cultural mores. In Stewart's case, in Stewart's case, He never actually mentioned the word obscenity. Instead, he was speaking about hardcore pornography. In the case, Jacobellas versus Ohio, the court was tasked to rule on whether Ohio's ban of Louis Marais' French film, Les Amants, was consistent with the First Amendment, and it wasn't. As the song ended, Sarah thought someone's getting fired for that. She decided to hear what would happen next. It was two minutes into the next song, and it started sounding very familiar. A lot of the same language was being used, X-rated stuff and all. She didn't know everything about broadcasting standards, but she was fairly certain fuck still wasn't allowed to be broadcast over the air. Wait, she said to no one. It's the same song. What the hell? It was, in fact. It played four more times back-to-back before another song came on and the signal began to fade. Her first thought was that she was receiving a signal from someone's personal transmitter. They're archaic, but she would be surprised if it still wasn't emerging tech out here in this part of the country. They were small devices that allowed you to choose from a few frequencies, usually the 87 to 88 megahertz range and broadcast over a very limited area, for example, from your iPod to your car stereo. It was the same basic technology that old drive-in movie theaters would employ. However, there were no cars anywhere on the road, and she was able to hold the signal for five whole songs. Even so, she thought, what kind of maniac listened to the same song five times in a row? She could imagine someone rage driving, listening to the same song at top volume. Someone's not emotionally mature, she thought. She'd heard of radio stations, crack promotions departments doing this type of thing when they were introducing a new format. W Rat becomes the all new W Rat, and they play 48 Hours of Michael Jackson's Banner, the theme to The Sopranos. But no programmer in their right mind would play this song on the air even once, and most certainly not over and over again, back to back. She shrugged, well, another glitch in the matrix, I guess, she said quietly to herself. Thank you for listening to part one of The Bridge. It's The Bridge Podcast, episode one. 
This has been Jared. I'll talk to you guys soon. If you want to find me online, you can go to my website, jaredmorris.com. Jared Morris Radio on Facebook or at Jared Morris on Twitter. And um, for the 10X record site, jaredmorris.com works for that, too, if you want to check that out. All right, next time, we'll find out why things haven't gone exactly to plan for Sarah as she meets the chief of police from the Crow Agency Police Department. Coming up next.